Live from Lhasa, this is a special broadcast of China 24 Inside Tibet. Well, throughout the week, we have brought you up close to Tibet and have told you stories of the Tibetans. We start with a very unique art form here on the highland. Simple but passionate, Tibetan opera is a cherished art form that has flourished on the high plateau. And every year, thousands of Tibetans... Lavish, flamboyant, and amazingly eye-catching, Tibetan opera impresses with striking masks and vigorous dancing. It's been loved for centuries by the people on the high plateau. This opera troupe from Qinggai County in Shanan Prefecture is reliving a nation classic, Queen's No Sang. White Mask Opera is believed to be the oldest form of Tibetan opera. This repertoire is played extensively in Tibet. 65-year-old Kaman Tsiren is the oldest performer in the troupe. He learned his skills from his father and uncles, and now he's ready to pass it down to the next generation. I'm very happy to see that Tibetan opera is being revived. In Shannan Prefecture alone, there are 34 Tibetan opera troops. They are all well funded with the costumes, instruments, and stage props. It's reassuring to see that young actors are beginning to take up Tibetan opera. Historical pageantry, myth, and magic are woven together with earthly humor and scenes from the daily lives of ordinary Tibetans. The actor's passion is contagious. I have traveled all the way from the south for their show. Every year during the Showtime Festival, there is a comprehensive repertoire of Tibetan opera on show. We love it. The White Mask Opera is widely believed to be the oldest form of Tibetan opera, and this art form has become so essential in life that every year during the Shotong Festival, local Tibetans have put on their best dress and come to Nobolinka to enjoy the performance. They love and grieve with the characters as if it is their own lives. Their love and attention will help to preserve the art form for more years to come. Zhang Yinyi, CCTV, Lhasa. Well, Zoya, of course, leading all our live coverage over in Lhasa. We're experiencing a bit of a technical problem over there. We'll get back to him as soon as we can. But let's continue with the other stories that our news team has prepared out there. Just there, we heard Zhang Yinyi introducing uh, the art of Tibetan opera to us as we continue with our focus on how people really live over in Lhasa, not just during this Shotong festival. But to continue with that same theme, the ancient art of Tibetan opera has, of course, developed not over years, but over many centuries, considered as the living fossil of traditional culture there. It's still very much part of local lives. Our reporter, Ai Kui Yu, went to a legendary figure who's dedicated his entire life to this one art form. Here's what he said. Uno Chongba, a legend of the White Mask Opera in Mimu County, is 77 years old. He's the only person who can sing and dance this particular opera. Therefore, different towns and artistic groups would be honored to invite him as a master to teach and share his talent. For Chongba, learning and teaching has multiple meanings. I can't let the history vanish and be forgotten. I must pass on this grand performance and try to motivate the youth to study with me. Chumba became the head of Nim Opera Group when he was 65. Normally, an elderly person would be enjoying his retired life without any such obligations. However, he couldn't let the young students down, especially when he found that they were really good at it. I would love to pass down my skills to the kids because I know they are really into the opera and working very hard. Wuna Chumba told me that when he started to study the Tibetan opera 60 years ago, it was not out of love for music. It was because he had to make a living. Now the young generation has more options. For some, learning the opera sounds a little too hard and boring. However, there are still young people who have true love for it. These boys and girls are in their senior high school years. They work in this folklore park, offering the local White Mask Opera show to tourists. After finishing junior high school, most of their friends left home to work in different places in order to make more money for their families. Those who had the chance to get picked to study the opera were quite lucky. 
I have only studied for one month and it will take me at least three years to reach master's level. I have many friends who are desperate to learn the opera, but they have to fight for their lives. Bunchon is also an opera student, but his daily job is still farming. He learns the opera and sings while working. Chumba likes to stop at friends' houses when he has spare time. The host offers barley wine to guests with a little butter on the cup to show respect. When the mood gets animated, they sing some parts of the Tibetan opera to toast to friendship and to a good harvest year. It's hard to define the culture and the spiritual importance of the Tibetan opera to the local people. Chomba said if he were invited again to the opera show at Norbalinka during the Shoten festival, it would be the greatest honor for him. Currently, 14 of his students were chosen to participate in the grand show in Lhasa, and Chomba has decided to teach his son, who is already a good drummer, how to sing and dance. Akui, CCTV. As a look at the traditions of Tibetan opera, but of course life there is not all about music. We're also going to look at farming, we're going to look at how the economy is run, and also at health care for everybody living in the region. That's all coming up next. I'm going to be back with you a bit later on, up next Inside Tibet, with my colleague Zoya. Yeah. Well, that was a blackout several minutes ago, and some of the lightings in the Patala Palace has also been off. Well, that's also how Tibetans have been living their life. And now let's turn to the average Tibetans, how they live in farms and cities. Well, they have their own stories of struggles and happiness. Tibet is home to some of China's biggest sheep and cattle farms. But for thousands of years, these fertile farmlands have been home to animals and their herders. But these days, the lives of millions of herders are undergoing tremendous changes they've never seen before. Our reporter Han Peng has this report. For thousands of years, Tibetans traditionally followed a tranquil and nomadic lifestyle. The natural environment can be harsh, temperatures are low, and oxygen is deficient. But the herdsmen raise their cattle and sheep, despite what nature throws at them. For Chime La Song, it was the only way of life she knew and loved. Mother Nature has given us clear skies, abundant water, green grass, and many yaks and sheep. We've got everything for a nomadic lifestyle, passed down by our ancestors. But one thing they didn't have is a warm home. This is a typical herdsman's tent in Tibet. Small and dark, it houses three generations. It's portable allowing the family to take it down and put it up whenever they move to greener pastures. Today, these tents are not disappearing, but they're only seen in summer. In winter, almost everyone like Chimi lives in the proper house. The livestock live on the ground floor. People live upstairs. The houses are specially designed for herdsmen. And electricity instead of the oil lamps and candles they used to rely on for generations, is powered by one of the plateau's most abundant natural resources, the sand. In the beginning, we didn't dare use the solar energy because we believe the sun is the god and is disrespectful to use the resource. But now we found it's quite convenient, so why not? All these are gradually reshaping their way of life. Now that they settle down in permanent homes, they keep fewer livestock, a necessary trade-off to protect the grassland. Chime's husband have moved into a city, looking for a job. 
The thing is, you kids. In the city, you earn far more money than raising livestock here. Though I do miss him a lot because we used to see him every day. China's rapid urbanization is reaching far and wide, and is pulling this most remote region with it. For better or for worse, Chi Melaso knows her life may never be the same again. Han Peng, CCTV, Tibet. And we now have my colleague Han Peng here in the studio to talk about the lives of those herdsmen in the north. Well, it seems that the problem is, is twofold. One way they have to keep their way of life. On the other way, they have to develop their economy and become urbanized. Exactly. So, what is the problem there? But now that millions of Tibetans are beginning to settle down, it seems that the whole region is moving toward urbanization. Uh, it, this provides the uh, Tibetans with mo all, the ki all kinds of modern conveniences they've never had access to before. But uh, this, there's also real concern whether urbanization comes to the cost of the whole region losing its character. In many other parts of China, we, we have already seen that urbanization has resulted in huge gap and barrier between urban and rural areas, and meanwhile villages lose their original uh, culture as well as their energy. So Tibet is an amazing land with unique people and distinctive yeah. culture. We all hope that as their life is getting better, Tibetan customs and cultures could be kept alive. And we all hope so. Let's talk about one a herdsman in particular. Uh, her his name is Wang Du. He's a former Tibetan herdsman, but now he is a successful Tibetan antique shop owner. But as he tells us, it's not his commercial success that is really important. What he can do to preserve and promote Tibetan culture is what really matters. <laughs> Welcome to Bakur Street in Lhasa, a window to the world of Tibetan articles and antiques. Wangdu's antique shop occupies the best location at the southeastern corner of Bakur Street. It's not big, but compact enough to display various kinds of Tibetan-style jewelry and antiques. The 42-year-old former Sikaza herdsman and his wife have been running their antique business in Lhasa for more than 20 years. Starting out with selling their goods at a store, the couple now own three antique outlets. I grew up in the rural area of Sigaza Prefecture. When I was 13 years old, I went to study ethnic Tibetan culture at the Tibet Buddhism College. After six years of efforts, I graduated as a major in the Tibetan language and learned how to identify turquoises, red corals, and many other Tibetan antiques. Studying Tibetan language and culture has given Wang Du an advantage when it comes to finding antiques and relics. Every winter during the tourist off-season, Wang Du and his wife visit different places in Tibet, seeking old treasures from rural families. But he has found that, as people's living standards have improved, old articles are becoming increasingly rare to find. This concerns him, but not only from an economic point of view. While Tang Ka and Buddha statues are enshrined and worship in temples, many of the old articles for Tibetans daily use are hard to find nowadays. Fewer and fewer young Tibetans have the chance to see them, and they know very little about our ancient traditions. So even if I find a really good object, I won't sell it even if it could make me good money. Wang Du treasures each article of his collections very much. He believes they tell the life stories of ancient Tibetans. For him, these are symbols of Tibetan culture and tradition. Wang Du says as a Tibetan, he's duty-bound to preserve the culture and heritage of his own ethnic group. He says his dream is to open a small museum when his collection of ancient Tibetan treasures is big enough to help more people better understand the history and culture of Tibet. Liu Ying, CCTV, Lhasa, Tibet. And let's try to close in on one or several Tibetans living in Baku Street. For that, let's cross over to our reporter Han Bin, who is now at Lhasa's central Baku Street. Well, Han Bin, what can you tell us about the lives of ordinary Tibetans in the city as you have been interviewing many of them? 
Well, the Jokong Temple is the back of the Barker Street. At the daytime, it's full of the pilgrims, but now in the evening, most of the people here are the tourists. Well, when we compare with the living styles here, we find the Tibetans live a relatively slow and serene lifestyle. The people outside here, uh, older generations of people, they would make the circuits of the temples and drinking the Tibetan teas. Well, the younger Chinese uh, Tibetans today, they have a variety of choices for leisure. For example, going to the pubs, eating out with friends. Or going to shopping. Let me take a few questions with its owner. You are from where? Where are you coming from? I am from Gansu, Gansu. Oh, you are coming from Gansu. How is the business like? How is the business like? Business is good. Good. So, uh, why you come here? Why you come here? Why you come here? And why you like it here? Why you like it? Why you come here? 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 Why you come the lifestyle of Tibetan here. So what I think is, is the Buddhist ancient city of Lhasa is becoming a modern urban center. So yeah. Well, it seems that the business is still on and a lot of tourists surrounding you. So do you mean that Lhasa is like any other cities in China, a lot of shops and consumers and tourists? What is the impact of those changes on the lives of Tibetans? Well, to answer your question, I brought with me a friend, uh, Medol. He is a Tibetan girl who is now working in Shanghai and pays home a visit now. Medol in Tibetan language means flower. Just did it. <laughs> okay. So, and how to see the changes that are affecting the Tibetan lifestyles here? Yeah, exactly. Uh, in Lhasa, has so many change in this year. As you see, so many uh, people for traveling here, and they also bring a lot. Well, I'm afraid we've lost a Hanbin there, and he is talking uh, to a girl who has been traveling all around China and explaining what is the appeal of Tibet. And for more on that, we have Mr. Luo Sang Pandeng, principal of Lhasa Kungsheng Language School, in the studio to share his insights about the lives of modern Tibetans. Well, Luo Sang, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, how would you compare the lives of Tibetans uh, with that, say, 50, 60 years ago? Well, uh, let me uh, focus on the last 30 years, because I was born in the late 60s. I have uh, experienced that development with my own eyes. Yes. So let's say, uh, you know, Tibet looks new every day, because every day you will find new road is being paved, uh, big buildings, bridges, and shopping centers is finished and open to the public. There's so many things coming, you know, uh, going on. And uh, as education, as an example, at present we have about 1,127 schools with the number of almost 0.6 million and study. And that's, that's, that's a very big change for... for that's for, almost for half of the population in Tibet. Uh, yeah, we have about, uh, let's see, uh, 3 million people. Mm. Uh, in, in the whole region, so that's a, that's a big number, education. Uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges for Tibetans to become even better off, materially and culturally? Well, let's see, uh, you know, Tibet enjoys the, the double digits growth in GDP mm. in the last 30 years. Mm. That's higher than uh, national average GDP. And, uh, but we still have beautiful sunshine. Yes. You know, we, we have blue skies, water is clean. But to be able to sustain this kind of development, we need a lot of qualified people. Mm. As I told you earlier, we have a you know, big number of school and huge number of students. So the, the education is widespread. Mm. And now we need to do is we need to improve the quality of education in Tibet so we can sustain and maintain this, this uh, a big growth economic talking, and talking about the quality of life well mm -hmm. many people uh, have taken up jobs like uh, tradesmen or, or shop owners rather than farmers and herdsmen uh, which they were used to be so what is your vision of the social makeup of Tibetans in the future well I, s I see the social makeup all the society is become a very diverse uh, and as you say the 
every year there's a big number of herdsmen and uh, farmers move into the cities, try to you know, improve their lives, try to make more incomes in the cities, run uh, shops, uh, you know, and uh, uh, work in the restaurant, even work in the construction field. But many of them going back to live the traditional way, but still many of them live in the cities. Even they move their families back to the cities, try to improve their family and their education uh, you know, situation. Mm. So I think it's, it's, it's a good, that, good to that way because it's nice to have people to, it's nice to people have the choice to, to decide uh, you know, the, their way of life. So uh, I, it, it is very important too because uh, you know, people really like to. Okay. If people like to live, live in a city, that's their choice. Yeah. Well, that's why they say that the Tibetans are moving along. Thank you very much, Lo Sang, you. for Thank your you. insight. Yeah. And uh, it's supposed that um, my colleague Han Ming is still strolling around Baku Street and talking uh, with his guide. Uh, let's try to get hold of Han Ming once again. Han Ming? Yeah, yeah, actually, my friend uh, Madel, a Tibetan people here and talking with me about the changes of the lifestyles by the changes of modernization yes. in the city. Yes, and uh, now we have like more modern buildings raising up in the old city area right now. And also the lifestyle for the Tibetan people has changed in some parts, but also uh, in some another part we also can keep very good. I think, I think it's very complicated here. It seems the changes are inevitable. Mm -hmm. I think the crucial thing is to protect Tibetan culture. What is yeah. happening here can also be happening elsewhere. So Tibet is not a unique case. Mm -hmm. So if we see the future of Tibet lies in the hands of the young Tibetans, mm -hmm. how would you see their role in protecting the culture? Uh, of course, I think the most important thing for the young people right now is the study. Uh, we're not only learning about the traditional cultures, uh, also need to learn some like other um, cultures, like some other uh, new ideas, some new uh, other knowledges. But how do you see the role of Chinese government can take? Uh, of course, I think uh, the most of res most of the responsibility for the Chinese government they should should support us very well for in this case as the same like what they are doing right now. And how about the tourists? Yeah, um, um, for, for the tourists, I really hope to respect our culture. Like for example, if you want to go to some monastery, you should follow the rules of the monastery. And also, if you go somewhere for traveling, you should keep well the environment. And also, learning something um, like how to communicate well with the Tibetan here. So there's no easy answer, the good things or bad things, but I think we need to, to find the reasons behind all the yeah. changes. <laughs> and what is going on here deserves our long-term observation, yes, right? Yes, yes. Well, thank you yes, for joining yes, us, yes, Madel. Yes, yes, and yes. back to you, Zoya. Yeah. All right, thank you, Hanbin, and your guest. Please keep strolling around there. And now let's move south. In the lower land, in Ningchi Prefecture, tourism has changed the lives of many villagers there. And starting, uh, starting catering business have earned extra income for families than farming. A reporter, Ayang, went to the village and tell us their success story. The natural beauty of Ningchi Prefecture is the area's greatest resource. As more tourists come to Tibet to take in its breathtaking views, local families are looking to cash in on a booming industry. Farming used to be the major way of living for most Tibetans living in this area. But the geographical conditions are not ideal due to its high altitude. So in recent years, people here have turned to tourism. Travelers don't only come for the scenery, but also for the experience of living in a traditional Tibetan home. This is the first family-run hostel that opened in Tashigong Township. The hostel's popularity has made its 65-year-old owner famous as travelers flock to his business to spend the night. From February this year, Pang Sok has made 100,000 yuan running his hostel, 20 times more than what he earned farming a decade ago. 
People can reserve rooms online, and sometimes people do it one or two months in advance. When I'm fully booked, I also recommend my neighbor's hotels to people. Feng Tok says his hostel receives a few thousand tourists a year. He asks them to leave their business card as a souvenir. His hostel is so famous that many visitors from other countries are starting to arrive. Following his example, more than 20 other hostels have opened in Tashigang since 2000. But the success hasn't been easy to emulate. Lives have become much better thanks to tourism. The government has helped to build roads and sewage systems, but my family isn't big enough to run the business. I hope to get more help. Altogether, Tashigan Township now makes about 800,000 yuan a year from tourism. Although it will be a while before newcomers learn how to run a successful business like Pangtok, there is no doubt that tourism has on the whole changed lives for the better. Aiyang, CCTV, Ningchi Prefecture, Tibet. Well, this is Tibet. Some Tibetans have chosen to stay on the prairie to stay as herdsmen. Some others have chosen to come to the cities to begin their urban life. But they all want better quality of life. And most important of all, they have more choices of life. And this is our special coverage on Tibet for today. And tomorrow will be the last episode of Inside Tibet. And we will talk with some aspiring Tibetans who share their dreams with us about their land and the future. I'm Zoyan Lhasa, now back to James in Beijing.